thank you so much for joining us today. My name is Kitsubila Wale Sheila Matloko, and I would like to welcome you all to the AI Wayfinder series. Uh, this is the first of the mini series that are upcoming. The purpose of this series is really to just provide a platform where some of the brightest minds in our university can share their expertise and experience in AI. So in the future, the series intends to explore a variety of topics under the umbrella of um, artificial intelligence. Uh, the point is just to, because sometimes you find that so many people are working on AI and you are not aware on who is doing what on campus. So I'm not going to talk for a long time. Um, today's Wayfinder is Professor Susan Brokenshaw. Uh, she's an applied ling linguist in the Department of English at the University of Buffy State. She's also a co-convener for Engaging the Digital in the Interdisciplinary Center for Digital Futures, also here in the university. Uh, Professor Susan has a passion for education, and in recent years, she has focused her attention on ethical and societal impact of emerging technologies in educational spaces. So, yes, without further ado, um, Professor Susan, I would like to hand over the session to you. Oh, thank you so very much for that. And um, I feel quite privileged. I did not know that this was the very first um, webinar or presentation in the AI Wayfinder seminar series. Um, so thank you so much for that. So before I begin, I would like to extend a sincere thank you uh, to the ICDF and to the Digital Scholarship Center for inviting me to present a session on ethics and policies with AI in the South African context. A special thank you is also extended to Sheila Makloko for the arrangements that she made around this presentation. And uh, by the way, I have used brackets in the main title since I'll be speaking predominantly about the South African landscape but with an awareness that the discussion can't be divorced from the rest of the continent. I was tempted to use the word hodgepodge uh, in the subtitle to signal that at this stage, guidelines around AI ethics and policies appear to be a rather confusing used mixture of different ideas, old and new. But I think the presentation itself will partially point to the patchwork picture that Africa reflects at the moment. I would also like to, at this point, acknowledge that part of this presentation is based on research that I conducted alongside my UFS colleagues and co-authors, Professor Edwin Kortzer and Dr. Birgit Senekal, who are based at the Department of Computer Science and Informatics on campus. The research that we did culminated in a 2023 monograph published by Chapman and Wall in the Artificial Intelligence and Robotics series. So I do draw somewhat heavily from excerpts of the book during this presentation. Now, the launch of ChatGPT by OpenAI um, in 2022 reignited a heated debate about the need for AI policy frameworks in Africa to make sure that this technology is used both ethically and responsibly. But before I discuss ethics and policies around AI, I do want to issue a few disclaimers and several points of clarification. First, the topic is a very broad and complex one, encompassing data prediction and data surveillance, for example, and spanning industries that run the gamut from finance and law to agriculture and healthcare. I will therefore narrow the focus to ethics and policies as they relate to AI and generative AI, in particular in higher education. Second, there are 54 sovereign 
countries on the continent that represent about 1.4 billion people, 3,000 indigenous groups, and approximately 2,000 languages. It would be quite presumptuous of me to call for a one-size-fits-all type approach with respect to policy frameworks around AI. A standardized set of ethics guidelines is therefore subordinated to those that reflect pluralistic and divergent voices with a view to accommodating all AI stakeholders in the loop, ranging from expert role players to actors in the general public who may have scant direct involvement in the design of AI tools, but who are nevertheless impacted by their deployment, whether for good or for ill. Third, I'm aware that I'll be playing rather fast and loose with terminology during this presentation. I say this because I'll be using terms like policy frameworks, policies, guidelines, and strategies interchangeably. They are not strictly synonymous, but I've decided not to be too pedantic at this stage about conceptualizing them. Generating documents around ethical use of generative AI is in its infancy in Africa, and the terms in use simply reflect the various stages in this process, depending on a particular country's position and response to the fourth industrial revolution. The stages include visualizing key ethical principles, carrying them out, testing them, and so on. Fourth, I've already alluded to the confused mixture of AI ethics and policies on the table. In fact, um, it's challenging to put together a full picture given significant gaps in the AI ethics literature. According to Emil Ormond from the Graduate School of Business Leadership at UNISA, the view we have of AI ethics and policies is what he calls an outside view. What this means essentially is that any findings and accompanying recommendations are really based on empirical data from AI experts and practitioners. Some of the information is even largely anecdotal. So why is there a need? to emphasize the development of ethical AI policy frameworks for Africa? Well, the answer is, of course, multidimensional and complex, but one answer pivots around how AI is potentially being used on the continent. In this regard, a recent article that appears in a think tank publication by the ECDPM or European Centre for Development Policy Management states that it is controversial to deploy AI in Africa because the continent has little representation in AI ecosystems, while bias around race and gender, for instance, are a reality. The ECDPM reports on a recent event that perfectly illustrates this dilemma. Last year, Sam Altman launched WorldCoin, a project aimed at creating a global financial database. The project entails, amongst other things, scanning a person's iris to determine personhood and uniqueness and whoever signs up receives an award in dollars. It ranges from about $49 to $54 at this stage. The project was rolled out in Kenya amongst many nations, and of course, there's no need for me to explain the ethical consequences of collecting biometric data in this fashion. Needless to say, the ECDPM article reports that the Kenyan government very quickly shut down World Coins operations. As an aside, it is also perhaps no surprise that FTX founder Sam Bankman Fried, you might know about him, is affiliated with the project and he is currently facing fraud charges in both the Bahamas and the USA. There in the right hand corner, you see a picture of a very 
unhappy Sam Bankman Fried as he was taken into custody recently. By the way, if you are interested and you play the stock markets or you are a gambling person, the world coin conversion rate as of today, 14 March 2024 in South Africa, stands at 176 rand and 29 cents with a 5.5% decline since yesterday. What this means is that today you could exchange five world coin for about 881 rand, which is not bad. So it is essential as a continent that is beset by unique socioeconomic and political challenges that we carefully consider how to go about regulating AI technologies. To paraphrase from the monograph I mentioned earlier, there is a tendency across the globe to simply cherry pick those ethics principles that appear to be aligned with governments and other institutions' agendas agendas which may or may not be unscrupulous. According to Italian and British philosopher Luciano Floridi, this type of cherry picking is no better than ethics shopping, which he defines as a practice according to which, and I quote, private and public actors shop for the kind of ethics that is best retrofitted to justify their current behaviours rather than revising their behaviours to make them consistent with a socially accepted ethical framework. To quote again from the monograph that I wrote with my colleagues, considering that one, current global guidelines are exclusive of African contexts and that too, the fourth IR is playing itself out differently on the continent. And three, um, in the context of major inequalities and inequities that may only be exacerbated rather than resolved through AI, there is an urgent need to avoid ethics shopping in favour of an approach that prudently and methodically embraces the inclusion of all. It falls beyond the scope of this session to speak at length about what South Africa and the rest of the continent are doing or perhaps not doing to regulate AI in general, but I would nevertheless like to showcase some of the continent's achievements. Egypt, for example, has a national AI strategy that during the course of this year will include further advances in AI investments as well as initiatives geared towards integrating AI with big data and blockchain technology, for example. Namibia has adopted what they refer to as the Windhoek Statement on AI that is aimed at mitigating the use of high-risk AI, such as fake recognition technologies. So the table that you are viewing right now uh, provides a snapshot, as it were, of just some of the many efforts African nations are making, not only to harness AI's benefits, but also to regulate its deployment. At present, only three African countries have made significant inroads when it comes to advancing AI policy documents. And it may or may not surprise you to hear that these countries making significant strides are Mauritius, Egypt and Kenya. Morocco, South Africa and Tunisia are literally described as waking up. This is according to the Global AI Index. What is encouraging is the establishment of an initiative referred to as AI4D Africa or Artificial Intelligence Development Africa. This project was implemented by the Swedish International Development Cooperation Agency in collaboration with Canada's Development Research Centre or IDRC. Among others, the initiative facilitates policy research aimed at responsible and democratic use of AI and machine learning. It has also formed partnerships with African countries, NIAL in Senegal, 
the Centre for Intellectual Property and Information Technology, or CIPIT, in Kenya, Research ICT Africa, and the African Observatory on Responsible AI are just some of the many organisations that are currently exploring research around the development of more formal AI policies that resist solutions to problems based solely on technological determinism. Narrowing down the focus now to ethics and policies with AI in the context of higher education in South Africa, data from January of this year shows that a number of universities in the country have begun publishing their policies on the use of this technology with a very specific focus on generative AI or Gen AI. This, for example, published its ChatGPT and other AI tools guidelines as these relate to teaching and learning. And as they indicate there, they will keep developing this guideline document as the technology evolves. In June last year, uh, Northwest University drafted a short document on ethical use of AI, also focusing on its use in the teaching and learning space. The University of uh, Pretoria's Department for Education Innovation recently published a student guide on using Gen AI as well as a more general guide for ChatGPT usage in both teaching and learning. And of course, the UFS itself has published its own guide aimed at helping academics navigate the tool. And I know that many people in the space listening to me today were part of um, collaborative efforts to get that guide out there. According to the African Observatory on Responsible Artificial Intelligence, universities, however, do need to look at a number of useful resources for further direction. The Southern African Regional Universities Association, or SARUA, for example, has brought out a statement on ChatGPT and other AI tools. Navigating their website will take you to some very useful guideline posts, as they call it, that cover myriad topics that could feed into our own um, policy documents. A study by the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development, or OECD, recently brought out their own guide entitled Emerging Governance of Generative AI in Education, which, among others, addresses key issues such as algorithmic bias, privacy, as well as data issues. Then, UNESCO's guidance for generative AI in education and research is quite informative. It is specifically geared towards global guidance on gen AI policies that will ultimately be human-centered. So what is clear is that in educational settings, what will be called for are guidelines that address a number of dimensions, although new ones will in all likelihood be added as AI and Gen AI uh, evolve. So first, AI ethics has to address students' needs, and this includes strategies that will provide them with discipline and or career-specific training in Gen AI that prepares them for the workplace. Second, such a guide will have to accommodate educators' needs as these pertain to teaching and learning spaces. Further, guidelines will have to take into account ethical issues related to academics' research environments. Coupled to this is an awareness of academic publishers and local journals' generative AI policies, which I will come back to in a short while. 
plagiarism and the definition thereof will, of course, also have to be revisited. Finally, any guidelines around these dimensions will have to take popular regulations into account as well. Talking of Popia, although I'm no legal expert, it goes without saying that in developing a policy framework around the ethical and responsible use of AI in educational spaces, a number of fundamental questions and issues need to be addressed that take into account the legal ramifications of creating such a framework, adopting it and then utilising it. This is particularly important because Africa currently has no legislation that governs Gen AI's regulation. Paraphrasing an article from Leader, SAAIA, or the Southern African Intelligence Association, was recently established to facilitate use of AI. Its well-known members are made up of the likes of Google, uh, University of Johannesburg, Schwane University of Technology, and Weber Wenzel. According to the website, SAAIA represents a step towards AI oversight and fills a significant gap given that the country has no formal policy initiatives or good practice standards. And this, I think, is where our law faculty will be very useful. I know that um, Gary Stopfort, for example, is also part of the ICDF. So we'll be looking to our legal practitioners um, to assist us in this regard. Focusing now on ethics and policies that pertain to plagiarism, there seems to be a tendency locally and abroad to simply create guidelines that are based solely on existing policies on plagiarism in general. Another a tendency is to simply regard generative AI as an author that needs to be cited. In this regard, I came across a very interesting article by a Michael Black in Medium. In this article, he comes to a number of conclusions based on the definition of plagiarism issued by the Association for Computing Machinery, or the ACM. Among other things, uh, Black states, and I quote what you can see in front of you there, AIs are yet to stay and will only get better. So how do you work with an AI in science ethically? Again, I think it's quite simple. Think of it as a human and cite it accordingly. Here are several common cases that apply to human contributions today that are easily extended to machine contributions. He then uh, provides us with some guidelines around um, acknowledging the use of AI he, for example, states that if someone helps you with your paper, you acknowledge this help. So what he's pretty much saying here is that we simply need to acknowledge that we have used ChatGPT uh, to help us with code, with data, with images and so forth. He also states that, and I quote, this is a bit out of fashion, but in older papers, one often sees citations to personal communication. If you had a chat with Einstein and he gave you some insight, you'd credit the idea with Einstein, personal communication. You can do the same with an AI. Now, we can only shake our heads at um, Michael Black's approach, but in his defence, this article was published in 2022, just after the launch of ChatGPT, when journals and scholars around the world had not yet carefully thought through what it really means to refer to the author in a Gen AI world. So much has changed in a short period of time since uh, articles by people like Michael Black, with editorial boards no longer so certain that ChatGPT can be regarded as an author, something that will have to be included in universities' Gen AI policy documents. Uh, for example, the ICNJE, the International Committee of Medical Journal Editors 
has a section entitled who is an author and um, in their estimation there are four very specific criteria that um, define exactly what an author is. As you can see there, one element that makes you an author, and you can um, in brackets read human author, is if a very substantial contribution is made to concepts, theories, the design of the work, etc., etc. And um, coupled to this is that there must be a substantial contribution to interpreting the data that has been collected. Another criterion has to do with the fact that you have to show proof that you yourself drafted or reviewed um, the content and the data critically. You also have to provide proof that there was final approval, approval rather, of the version that has been submitted to the journal. And finally, one has to show proof that there has been um, an agreement that you are accountable for any errors, uh, perhaps errors in data collection, errors in interpretation, um, et cetera, et cetera. If I look at another section um, of the website, they also call for authors to be highly transparent when they describe if and how AI was indeed used uh, in their manuscript. So I will only quote a few lines there. At submission, the journal should require authors to disclose whether they used AI-assisted technologies. Yeah, we're speaking about technologies such as LLMs, which are large language modules, chatbots, image creators, and the like. And then just to draw your attention to the last two sentences, which I think are quite important for ethics and policies, authors should not list AI and AI-assisted technologies as an author or co-author, nor cite AI as an author, which was, of course, what quite a few scholars did back in 2022. Authors should be able to assert that there is no plagiarism in their paper, including in text and images produced by the AI. Humans must ensure there is appropriate attribution of all quoted material, including full citations. University policies that address ethical use of AI by students and staff alike will need to address the notion that ChatGPT is not perceived as a qualified author that can account for exactly what goes into a study. Now, in a recent research study I co-authored with my colleague, Dr. Marisa Brooks, we noted that in Isabel Pedersen's view, it is necessary to think about how writing culture, for example, is threatened by Gen AI. I quote from her article, higher education will need to decide if using AI writing will be valued as an aesthetic or professional practice and a means to garner what social theorist Pierre Bordeaux calls cultural capital. This caveat pertains to all academic endeavors by students and staff. In the study, we address questions such as these. If it becomes the case that we shift into a reality in which AI can also write really well, then how do we determine our value as humans? How do we establish authorship? One useful way forward is to experiment with AI regulatory sandboxes, which of course is something that the ICDF is already doing. So this is a suggestion that has been put forward by a number of organizations such as the ECDP that I referred to earlier. Put a bit differently, this organization recommends that at this stage, we resist adopting regulations too prematurely, as quick and early adoption could be detrimental to innovation. 
They take what they call a wait and see approach that includes taking the time needed to understand AI in the context of AI regulatory sandboxes. Such spaces allow for flexible but carefully supervised environments in which AI policies and regulations can be tested and developed. The ECDPM mentions the Smart Africa Blueprint on AI and UNESCO's recommendations on AI ethics as two very useful resources for developing AI strategies. Since the UFS is already experimenting with AI sandboxes within the ICDF and um, Digital Scholarship Center, CTL, the next step is to safely test our use of the various technologies against the UFS's current AI guidelines and plagiarism policy. This testing can then form the foundation for an AI policy and a gen AI policy based on legal and ethical criteria that are aligned with the UFS's social and cultural values as outlined in Vision 130. A very useful open access book that was recently published by Springer is Responsible AI in Africa. And I would recommend anybody interested in ethical issues around AI to get hold of this open access book. In the book, an informative chapter I came across is one by Stoll and his colleagues who highlight their concern that in North Africa, little attention has been paid to addressing the ethical dimension of AI policies or strategies. This is, of course, a concern that is not unique to that part of Africa. What is more, in the monograph um, that I wrote with my colleagues, we do a deep dive into theories from philosophical traditions that inform policies and guidelines on ethical AI. One conclusion that we have reached, and one echoed by many other African scholars, is that these documents are not Africa inclusive, and that the Western-centric framing, while very useful, does not speak directly to the continent's unique economic, social and political challenges. One challenge that springs to mind relates to the shadow side of Africa's digital endeavors. In the book, we describe the existence of so-called digital dictatorships, which entail some governments using AI, for example, to track and control their citizens' freedoms. In Ethiopia, for instance, technology developed by China has been deployed to surveil journalists and opposition parties. Similar operations have taken place in countries like Angola and Zimbabwe. At least 13 countries in Africa make use of cyber troops which engage in regular trolling activities. It once again falls beyond the scope of this presentation to go into any detail, but suffice it to say here yeah, that ethics and policies around AI also need to consider cyber activism as forming part of digital citizen engagement. This type of digital literacy is key to mitigating AI being used as a tool for digital repression, surveillance, censorship, and the like. In the book, we suggest a relational ethics of care when it comes to responsible and ethical AI. Such a framework is guided by the reality that in Africa, any guidelines we generate need to take into account that technologies also impact marginalized and vulnerable populations. In calling for an ethics of care, we are mindful that it could be perceived as a framework that belittles or even patronizes people. However, as we state in the book, at any given time, we are all 
to a greater or lesser extent vulnerable to the perils of emerging technologies. And so the ethics of care that we have in mind is one that recognizes all of humanity within an AI ecosystem. We add that borrowing to some degree from Herring's argument in regard to the charge of condescension around ethics of care, we do not distinguish between a carer and a cared for. Instead, our conception of an ethics of care is one that looks to principles that, unlike those reflected within utilitarian frameworks, do not primarily accommodate the well-being and beliefs of the most advantaged over everyone else. As discussed in the book, training data sets in AI models might not represent diverse heterogeneous population groups thus aggravating biases and disparities. Working in the area of computer ethics, computer science and AI, Burton et al. echo concerns about utilitarianism's goodness and lack of sensitivity to different contexts, arguing that, and I quote, these shortcomings limit our ability to have substantive ethical discussions, even insofar as everyone assents to utilitarianism. A shared reliance on the principle of the greatest good for the greatest number does not help us agree about what goodness is. Close quote. Returning to Stahl et al., it is worth noting that they recommend a socio-technical approach when policies that advance the responsible and ethical use of AI are generated. This is the approach we ourselves took in the book, and it is one that reflects a systems approach. Like Stahl and, Stahl and colleagues, I am of the view that tackling AI policies from a systems perspective is key. As the authors correctly point out, and yeah, I'm quoting again, AI does not have ethical issues, but these emerge in contexts of use, depending on the stakeholders that are involved. Whether the ability of AI to detect patterns in the data and propose actions on this is ethically problematic has little to do with the technical implementation and more with the moral sensitivities of the people who are involved, close quote. Based on research conducted by Fremont Kast on social systems theory, I would suggest that AI ethics and policies should orbit around four systems, which are the technology, value, innovation, and order systems. Zhu and Peng summarize these systems as follows. The first system that you have in the figure there um, is the technology system, which of course has to do with products, hardware, software, and services. And yeah, ethical policies would have to emphasize controlling the risks of these products. The second system is the value system, and this has to do with our moral rationality. So if we think about this from the perspective of AI ethics and policies, and I'm quoting here from Zhu and Peng, AI is incapable of breaking the normal relationships between technology, people, society and nature, but it can have an influence on AI's ethical acceptability. The third uh, system is, of course, the innovation system. I'm quoting here again. Socialization of AI technology is manifested as innovative behaviors and activities under different application scenarios. Yeah, the ethical governance dimension focuses on the constraint of innovative behavior for AI. And then we have the fourth system, which is the system for distributing rights. It's called the order system. It has to do with distributing rights, powers, interests, and responsibilities under certain technical conditions. So how can the above principles then be operationalized in an ethics guide for students, for example? There are many answers to this question. 
Um, but when it comes to the issue of plagiarism, which may be uppermost in our minds, I would suggest policies that do not focus solely on punitive measures when students cheat. University of Wisconsin professor Joanne Orovic argues that adversarial measures leveled against students may only damage the academic student relationship further, and that what should capture our attention is encouraging students to use AI in ways that help them develop their full potential and recognize that they need to be mindful about responsible human AI collaboration. And even as I I say that, I know that I'm being a little bit romantic and possibly unrealistic. One of my favorite terms is unconscious incompetence, which essentially describes one's inability to understand and or to recognize a deficit. I argue that this concept should be integrated into policies so that students recognize the contradiction described by Washauer and his colleagues. This is the with or without contradiction that describes the dilemma in over-relying on AI before having developed one's own skills first. It also reminds me of a similar problem in mathematics where students need to solve mathematical problems manually before using a, a, a calculator. And I will come back to that in a moment. So to come back to the issue of incompetence and to go back to maths, it might be a good idea to look at the stages of uh, competence and then to keep them in mind um, when compiling ethics guidelines. I just want to quickly, I think I've mixed up my slides. I'm going to come back to this one in a moment. So getting to conscious incompetence, the stage at which we realize a deficit is key because as Zaki states, uh, just on that slide presentation there, this brings us to a crossroads where we have to decide whether we are going to work on this deficit or not. With respect to AI, this would mean students deciding to go on a journey of learning new skills or just letting the machine take over. What makes the learning space for students quite tricky is that they now need to learn how to apply their own skills, such as reasoning skills without AI, and then learn new skills that allow them to use AI to enhance these skills. So, let me go back to the previous slide to go back to the analogy of a calculator. I'm quoting a 2008 master's study by Christina Miles. Utilizing calculators during mathematics class may affect a student's cognitive level of mathematics concepts. The student may not need to learn certain fundamental operations and methods because the calculator will complete these calculations itself. Instead of memorizing multiplication tables for instant recall, a student can simply enter an equation into the calculator and he or she will receive the correct answer. I think several of us are already seeing a disconnect between what students submit for assessment and what they in reality are able to do without over-reliance on AI. Such an approach aligns well with one of the takeaways that emerged from an April 2023 Human Sciences Research Council webinar on Gen AI, during which panelists underscored the need for ethical guidelines that do not replace existing educational methods, but help to enhance these methods instead. AI policies should advocate for ethical digital literacy on the part of students that subordinates AI literacy's technical component to its cognitive and socio-emotional components. The cognitive dimension calls for a strong focus on students' own critical and reasoning skills, for example, while the socio-emotional dimension describes students' ability to reflect on and address AI's ethical and moral consequences. To quote Dignam, it is not the AI artifact or application that is ethical. 
trustworthy or responsible. Rather, it is the people and organizations that create, develop, or use these systems that should take responsibility and act in consideration of human values and ethical principles. Based on a study by Nakatumba Nabendi and her colleagues on AI and education, I would go so far as to recommend that in addition to creating policies around use of AI in education, we will need to consider introducing a course that focuses on AI ethics education. The authors explore how such a course is embedded in under and postgraduate computer science programs at universities across Africa. I would argue that such a course should also be taught across faculties. And so that is my rather hodgepodge presentation, and I do hope that it was to some degree informative. I thank you. Wow, this was informative. Um, as much as you say it was a hodgepodge, uh, you mm -hmm. did explain it very, very clearly. Thank you so much, Professor Susan. I just want to say to the panel that if you have a question, you can either raise your hand or write it in the comment section. Professor Susan, this was a very excellent presentation. I have taken down a lot of notes. Uh, my first question to you is that, are you open for collaboration within the UFS? Can, if people want to explore uh, researching this, can they reach out to you? Sheila, absolutely. In fact, I would say the more the merrier. Um, as I uh, alluded to in the presentation itself, we're going to have to get our legal practitioners um, on board um, so that we are aligned with POPIA and any formal documentation um, that the government generates in future. So yes, it would be fantastic. The more the merrier. <laughs> Okay, uh, I'm going to give over to Hercules Combrink. I see the hand is up. Thank you so much, and thank you so much for this uh, presentation. I would love to um, just ask a follow up question based mm -hmm. on, on what was presented. At what point, and this is maybe a bit more philosophical and mm -hmm. but but I would love to know what your thoughts are at what point would a system be mature enough to draft a concrete policy? The reason why I'm asking is it's this trade off between exploration and solidifying the concepts. And at this point mm -hmm. in time, we're exploring through the sandboxes um, mm -hmm. and we've provided some guidelines, et cetera. But at, one, at what point would you propose philosophically we mm -hmm. would be mature enough to concretely start implementing solid guidelines? Are we talking days, months, years, or when the ecosystem is at a mature enough stage? And, and what would that look like? I hope my question is clear. Oh, that's a really excellent question. You've actually laid it out with more clarity than I have in my own mind. I would say that we are just a few months away from putting together something that is quite substantive. Um, and I'm, I hate, I, I hope there's not, not a cop-out response, but um, even if we get to the stage of solidifying certain concepts, I don't think that with the way that AI, especially Gen AI, Gen AI is evolving, we're ever going to be able to put a full stop um, on the last sentence of a policy document. I think that we are going to keep coming up against brand new challenges. We're going to keep coming up against this existential crisis, this philosophical question of what does personhood mean? Is AI also a person? Will it have legal rights? Uh, would it be regarded as a citizen in its own right, for example? So I'm sorry for the kind of cop-out response, but I, I think it's going to be never-ending. And even if we have relatively mature systems, we're going to have to keep going back and revisiting those systems as AI develops. Um, AI is developing, 
I think, or I don't think, I think we all know this, it's developing much faster than we as human beings are able to keep pace with. So we refuse, we are, we are steps behind the, the technology and we are going to have to keep asking ourselves, but what is our place as human beings? in this space. I hope, um, Hercules, that answers your question. Uh, I, this is why I always say we need our, our legal team and, and we need our ethicists and our philosophers. Um, I think a philosopher is going to give you a, a far better answer um, than I could. Thank you so much. Pleasure. Okay, thank you. I just Is there anyone else who has a question or, or not? Okay, um, I just wanted to point out that, um, wait, before I point it out, I have one question, Professor Susan. Mm -hmm. um, lately, we've been seeing this trends where they create um, guidelines, uh, like faculty specific guidelines when it comes to using generative AI. And when you mentioned some of the needs that uh, the guidelines that are needed uh, or for ethics in higher education, you pointed out that it would rather be best to address it like education needs, student needs, um, lecturers needs, and, you know, it should be grouped according to that way. I just want to know, between this, having this faculty specific and mm -hmm. rather than having a one for all that addresses all these needs, what is your personal opinion on the guidelines that are currently in place, and what well, would you advise? Well, I, I think we, we is, you know, if I think about the UFS alone, I think we've already made some really, really good strides in this direction. At the risk of of making it sound complicated, I envisage a general policy document um, around um, plagiarism and AI because that is one of the, the, the deepest concerns. Uh, it concerns academic staff members, and it's of concern to students at the back of their minds. I know, for example, one of my master's students says she's so terrified of ChatGPT and of being accused of plagiarism that she hasn't gone near it, for example. So I think we're going to need a general policy document that addresses how we're going to deal with gen ai when a student uses it and uh, what kind of um guidelines and disciplinary measures uh, will be executed around misconduct in that area so that, that that's the one because there have to be several documents that's the one document um, the second type of uh, policy document that i envisage would be um one that is embedded in every faculty. And I say that because I think we need to tailor make it for every faculty, um, especially for your, your, your career orientated qualifications, because students will need to know how to use Gen AI in the workplace, uh, whether it's for finance or it's in the world of law, um, social work or psychology, it's going to have to be um, not just discipline specific, but also career specific. And um, I spoke about the needs of the student, the needs of the educator, and so on. But I don't see I don't see those as as being placed in in, in a separate space. Um, to come back to the idea of a systems perspective, we actually need both students and staff to realise that. All those issues, students' needs, staff needs, um, research spaces, that they're all interconnected. Let me give you an, an example. You have an undergraduate student. They made a way of um, ethical guidelines around the use of AI. Now, that's undergrad. As they evolve and they move from being a novice um, researcher to a more experienced um, research at mass and doctoral level, they will then also become aware that they're no longer just students. They are now writers who are potentially um, publishing their work. And that they will then have to become aware 
of uh, what journals, what, what, what editorial boards expect of them when they use AI. So now there's no longer just a question of students um, looking at using AI in an assignment. They now have to think about using AI as a published scholar. So there we have that connection. So that's why I speak about systems, that we have to think about all these issues in one as being in one ecosystem. They, they, they're not separated um, from one another, in other words. I hope that, that that more or less answers your question. No, it does. Thank you so much, Prof. Uh, thank you so much for your time and for sharing your expertise with us. Thank <laughs> you.